Today on Películas with the Bros, we review the movie Babylon, directed by Damien Chazelle. And we have hot takes like, Babylon is the end of Hollywood. And, is Babylon the first good movie about making movies? Bro. What's up, bro? What's up, bro? And welcome, everybody, to the show. This is Películas with the Bros. My name's Adrian. My name's Ivan. And Pelicos with the Bros is a show where me and my brother Ivan discuss a movie. Every week we discuss a new movie. Ivan, what's the movie of the week? Babylon. Babylon. Be careful with that uh, thing you have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. People don't like to hear that. Oh, he's. Just... But the point is to like leave it there that way. Anything for the people. Okay, that's true. Ivan's uh, getting over a little cold, so he's chewing mesti m uh, like a. Uh... Mestizo. Mestizo, yep. He's chewing mestizos in his mouth. Shout out to all the mestizos out there. <laughs> uh, but we digress. Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. If this is your first time listening, first time watching, I apologize for the shenanigans that we started off with. But just to let you know, we are a podcast that every week we talk about a new movie. Usually we do the latest movies that are out. Uh, we're behind schedule right now, so we're catching up. Right now we're doing Babylon. But next week we're going to do um, uh, Knives Up. So if you... If Knives Out. Knives Out. A No. Uh, Glass Onion. A Knives Out Story? Yes, something like that. God. And if you're into that kind of thing, so uh, hit that subscribe button and get ready for that. And before uh, we move on, we're going to talk about Babylon. So let us know what you think about Babylon in the comments below. But Ivan, are you ready to put on a little red dress? Yeah. Get, get ready to dance uh, and be caressed by a hedonistic crowd as if you're the next it girl? Would you do that? Would you do Some that for more. us? For the audience? Sure. Um, well, good. Because Ivan, the movie of the week is Babylon. Written and directed by Damien Chazelle. The premise of this movie. <clears throat> it's the 1920s. And we are in Hollywood, California. Cocaine. Amphetamines. Women. Men. Elephants. You name it, you got it. And guess who wants it? Nellie, an aspiring actress, Jack Conrad, a huge film star, and Manny, a Mexican immigrant, uh, wanting to break it into the movie business. We follow these three and others in showbiz as they navigate the wild and murky waters of Hollywood. Give me like a Hollywood, baby. Like, give me a, a sound right there. Like, da, 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 da. like a, let me say the last line. As, uh, and others in show business as they navigate the wild and murky waters of Hollywood. Okay, I was thinking more like a little theme song, but yeah, right. that'll do. Uh, the cast is Brad Pitt as Chuck, Jack Conrad, Margot Robbie as Nellie Leroy, Diego Calva as Manny Torres, Jean Smart as Eleanor St. John, Jovan Adepo as Sidney uh, Palmer, Lee John Lee as Lady Fauju, Ivan Damien Chazelle. Yeah. Whiplash, La La Land, First Man, and this movie. Kind you missed with First Man, didn't you? We did a podcast <laughs> years ago yeah. on First Man. Yeah. I don't think people even have access to that bad boy. Yeah. If you find it, we'll personally thank you. <laughs> In a weird way. Yeah. Um, but Damien Chazelle, which one of those movies have you seen? Whiplash, La La Land, First Man. All but La La Land. Me too. If do you know of his style? Can you say like Damien Chazelle? Oh, he's that guy that does this really well. Seems pretty musical. Yes, except for First Man. I'm sure the soundtrack. I, I feel like if I rewatched it, I would see a little of that musicality that he has. Yeah, the and the one <clears throat> through line in all those movies is the price of like the cost of getting what you want whiplash the cost of the drummer guy trying to make it you know he sacrifices a lot la la land i haven't seen it like you uh but i'm sure there's like a cost to fame and whatever right there first man um you know i'm stronger buzz aldrin nearly nearly armstrong's cost to get to the moon losing basically his family in the in meanwhile that seems like a running motif in it. Also, the entertainment industry, right? Uh, 
entertaining people and like the cost of the entertainment industry including this movie one thing that i find really interesting is that i haven't seen la la land it seems like made for me in a weird way would you say that i'm i'm gonna watch it soon for sure me too for sure for sure for sure for sure um the one weird thing about damien chazelle is that when i think about him and i know he's like a big time director i know when a movie comes out of his a lot of uh cinephiles start chattering around oh you heard Chazelle Chazelle he's coming out one thing I can't pinpoint is a a particular style like I kind of think of him as an auteur but I don't know what his style is and I don't think it's because of lack of movies do you do you feel the same way or <gasps> it's a, little, a little extravagant like a, a Baz what's his face you think so Baz is way more, but yeah, like all of his movies are definitely like uh, an event. Yeah, I kind of think like a uh, close up to like, dun, 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 dun. <laughs> you know, um, something about First Man like that I remember is how realistic it was, which I think maybe was is what's kind of throwing me off too, because mm -hmm. like. It might have been that one film that doesn't really match with his previous films. I remember the the climax of the the movie being him getting to the moon, basically. Yeah. yeah. And that felt like an event. Yes. That's where I kind of felt his his uh personality. Maybe it's also like building up to <coughs> an explosion scene mm. right yeah uh i was watching like a video essay on chazelle and the guy was describing how he does like endings perfectly and he did whiplash and uh la la land where like they were both long scenes at the end like 10 minutes or longer and it starts like it starts low and it builds up builds up until a climax and ends mm. Uh, does this movie have that? Does it end with like a whimper? No, it kind of ends with like a <laughs> right. It's like a space odyssey. That's how it ended. Yeah, we'll talk about it more later. But yeah, yeah. you're right. Um, cool, Ivan. Here on Put It Close with the Rose, we like to we like to eat the sausage, which sounds <laughs> incorrect, but we like to eat the sausage. But more importantly, we like to look at how the sausage was made. Oh. So, let's look at how... Oh, he's opening something. This is a sausage wrapping. It's interesting because you can't just know how it's made by opening it. Well, you, that's that's how you start. Oh, that's true. Come on, Adrian. Where there where there's a will, there's a way. Yes. Uh, let's open up uh, this beautiful movie, Babylon, and see how it's made. There's not much uh, details mm. that I got uh, other than Robbie and Pitt were signed up in 2019. Uh, Chazelle had the script for a while now and um, decided to make other movies because it, it was going to be hard to make this kind of movie just like all the things that were going on uh, Diego Calva the guy that plays Manny in this movie the Mexican immigrant he uh, was spotted in a he head shop by Chazelle and he's like this guy looks like he has something Chazelle said he, ran he reminded me of Al Pacino racist a uh, script ins inspired by a show called Babylon Berlin. It's a German show. Uh, I only saw the trailer for it, but the trailer basically looked like the beginning of this movie. Mm. And I was like, oh, wow. But I don't think the plot is anything mm. similar. Uh, I've, I've, do you know what Babylon means? Isn't it like a place in Europe? It was a, it was a city in Afghanistan area. And it was supposed to be like the Mecca of of right. wor the world, right? Like culture and all that. But it also means in... Um, Destruction. It means like the bad part of society to uh, Rastafarians. <laughs> but I think Chazelle's going for the Babylon of old, of Afghanistan ilk, right? Could be both. Ooh. Could Come be on. both. Double... 
as Jay-Z would say, a double entendre. Wow. Ivan, your expectation for Babylon. High. High, high? Pretty high. Brad Pitt? That's it. Oh. <laughs> Margot Robbie? Yeah. There is something about Margot that I feel like she's being, she's in my face too much right now. I, it's because she's playing the same character. Yeah. Like a high energy, wild. Joyzy girl. Harley Quinn. I have a question that I was going to ask later, but I might as well ask now. How long, how many movies does she use the Joyzy accent until like, they're like, all right, we all, we Joyzy her too much. We took I, out all the Joyzy from her. I think this is the last one. I think she was probably done before, but then they're like Babylon, Brad Pitt. Like, okay, one more Joyzy. <laughs> one more Joyzy girl. Oh. To be honest, that scene in Birds of Prey, Harley Quinn movie, I don't even know why they call it Birds of Prey. Horrible name. That scene when she's eating that uh, slider. Joyzy egg slider. Oh, that slider. I would eat that slider up. Um, great, mo- great scene. Great scene. Not great movie. Uh, high expectations. Yeah. I saw the trailer and I thought the trailer was amazing, mm-hmm. but I felt like I needed an extra push that push could have came from like word of mouth that this movie is going to be like amazing, but there was no word of mouth like that. So I was, I, my expectations started high and they, uh, damn dampered as mm. time went on. Same for you or were they always high? I just had a good feeling it was going to be good. Okay. Saying that Ivan, what do you think of Babylon? It's great. It's great. It's great. <laughs> this movie is sort of what you've asked for, right? Like, can we just have fun? Yeah. And oh boy. Slap that knee. Ye- <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this movie's fun, right? Yeah. Um, three hours of fun, which is impressive. Three hours of fun. It's exhausting. Meant to be exhausting, though, right? Yeah. I feel like he's like, Chazelle's state of mind is, let's make these people feel what what it feels like to have cocaine in your nose for three hours. I think he did it right. Mm. Um, it's funny. Mm-hmm. Like, I laughed a lot more than I thought I would. Yeah. Uh, disgusting. I was impressed of how gross it was for the first, like, two minutes. Yeah. First, it was the poop, the, the elephant pooping. Like, it was a... A healthy shot of a, an elephant's poop hole doing its job for at least ten seconds. Yeah, very watery, very viscous, <laughs> very chunky, chunky, delectable. Oh yeah, titillating. So good, so good, and so much poop that I was like, "Is this movie gonna be like <laughs> just like a fuck you to everyone?" Yeah. And then when the girl pees in the guy's mouth, I was like, oh, yeah. I was like, yeah. Let's get cooking. We're in for a long one in this one. Oh, yeah. There's like an elderly couple to the side of me. I would I shouldn't say elderly. They were like at least 60. Elderly. And the guy, they were like talking and acting in a way where I was thinking like, this is like the awkward conversations. They're like having small chit chat to avoid the awkwardness of the movie at points hmm. you know like maybe they usually don't see this kind of movie uh, or see this kind of thing so they're like talking to make it not awkward like oh that's kind of disgusting isn't it <laughs> you know what i mean yeah and i was like oh man good job movie good job <laughs> you're doing the part you're doing the good thing um yeah and stamina testing like it is fun but it, it's quite exhausting i was in it you was in there. It. okay we talked about the girl peeing in the guy's mouth. We talked about the elephant elephant shitting on the guy. Uh, Margot Nelly's character throws up all over a guy in this movie. Liquid coming out of every orifice in any way you would imagine. Um, kind of a crazy movie to start th- just like this, right? And the first mm-hmm. 30 minutes are just like wham, bam, 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 bam. What do you think about the first 30 minutes and then like... Babylon on the title screen. I was I was just happy. 
like yeah. everything was fun yeah i was like this is good i like this would you go to that party uh once yeah i would definitely go but the question is like what would you be doing at the party just like mm, mm. i would i would definitely be just like taking notes yeah like oh that high level executive is eating uh, a girl's eyebrow right now okay gonna keep that in the iou bank Cha-ching. see if i could take a photo shoot of that um that fat guy is uh hitting on that cute girl and that cute girl likes it all right taking that as a note Cha-ching. definitely wouldn't be um having an orgy or anything doing cocaine uh having a girl pee in my mouth all things that we see in this movie um but that being said, that part's beautiful. <laughs> that part's fast. That part's crazy. The butthole of LA is crazy. Um, the filming parts are like fast, like boom, boom, boom. Everything's just like coming at you. Mm-hmm. That being said, it's still like a narrative that you. It's easy to understand, right? Yeah. Like the come up of uh, of Nelly, easy to follow. The come up of Manny, easy to follow. It's basically a story of like trying to attain fame or keeping your fame Mm -hmm. um fame and stardom how it drives and takes over another thing that chazelle is like really interested in like all the things we do to be successful um and how it's fleeting in a way you know like nelly is wants to be this famous actress Mm -hmm. she wants to do this Manny, he wants to be a uh, part of the film industry. But why, right? Jack, he 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 wants to keep being the best or the biggest star. Mm-hmm. But what is the true purpose of this? And that's something the film kind of shines a light on and, and we'll talk about that more in a bit. Um One thing that's interesting to me though is like I think Chazelle has this um how would you say uh, his his hand on the pulse of the culture in a way? Mm-hmm. Because now, how should I say this? We're in a time right now where like people are seeking happiness more than ever mm-hmm. over like money, over even fame. Some might think, and this movie is kind of like a depiction of like how bad fame can be, right? How toxic it could be. Um, and I was just reading this, uh, it's kind of like a tangent, but it's on par of, and it's, it relates to the menu, the movie we watched. Mm -hmm. Have you heard of Noma? Basically the most popular, uh, well-reviewed restaurant ever in, uh, Denmark. And essentially they're closing down because they, the owner's like, I can't, in good conscience. I can't provide, I can't give like the food quality that I want to give and be able to um, have like a healthy lifestyle for not only me, but for like all my employees. Right. And he's like, I want the people that work for me to be able to raise a kid, have a house and like their job. And so I can't, I'm going to fire all of them. So yeah. And he's like in 2024 is going to 2024. We're going to close. Yeah. And it's like this push towards like this realization of like, oh, all these things that I want, they don't make me happy. Right. And now society's like, I want to be happy, but how am I going to be happy with no money? Like there, it seems like we're swinging the other way as a culture to like finding happiness, but there has to be a middle ground of like, I need to find happiness, but I need to be able to sustain a To put a roof over my head, to feed my kids, to feed myself. Do you think we're going to go more towards that or more towards like the capitalistic nature of what uh, America has been for so long? I think we're just going to go like meet in the middle instead of having uber famous people where like four billion people know them. Mm -hmm. It's going to just be more spread out fame. Yeah. Like you'll probably run into someone who has like 
millions of whatever's followers, whatever the metric is, more often than you'll ever see like that, the billion Mm -hmm. sort of person. Mm -hmm. And I I just don't think we'll have celebrities like we used to. Like, I think now we'll see like Adam Driver and be like, oh, that's a respectable man. Like, I want to be his friend sort of thing. Mm. But before, like 50 years ago, like, Adam Driver, give me your autograph. I want to be you. Yeah. And I think that's what's changing. Yeah. And um, kind of even on the side tangent of that, uh, AI and like this chat. What is it? Chat GPT? Some. Yeah. Uh, A lot of people are complaining about that. A lot of people are complaining also about uh, AR. AI art and uh, animators, illustrators are like, my job is gone. <laughs> but I think there's like, if you look at it a different way, or I shouldn't say look at it a different way, like look at the potential that you have now as a solo animator, right? Yeah. Like if we can use, if, if it took hundreds of millions of dollars to make Frozen or hundreds of millions of dollars to make a stop motion, whatever, now with an AI as your assistant, it won't cost you that much money. Now you as a solo animator have a, essentially a computer to help you create things that before wasn't impossible. You just need to create the theme and the AI can create the rest. And it's like being a producer. Yeah. But now, like you're saying, instead of an isolated place to create, an isolated... uh guy that's famous an isolated girl that's famous now it's everything's getting spread out yeah. so more opportunity for everyone and the cream will rise right and if your art is up to snuff people are going to watch it and it's going to be less than it was before uh joe schmo making the next uh mini pixar movie is not going to get 200 million dollars as you much. don't need that yeah like he's not going to be uh he's not going to make finding dory Eight hundred million dollars in the box office, but he's gonna make a million dollars from the hundred thousand people that like his movie. Exactly, which is all you need. That is all you need. I think I see the AI stuff, but it's just you gotta evolve with what's already happening. Like it's not gonna stop, so you might as well learn how to live with it and use it to your gain. And then it's also like it kind of coincides with this need for us this up this uh need for a lot of people that they want to be happy now right Mm -hmm. because like i don't want to work as much okay you don't want to work as much here's your ai tool now you don't have to work as much and these guys these ais are replacing the need for this kind of labor so now you can do something else right now the only question is like i need money to survive so that's a whole another thing like Kill or be killed. Kill or be killed. I've been, one thing that I really like about this movie is that we're in a we're in a setting that we're usually not in, the <laughs> tens and twenties of Hollywood. Thirty years, forty years before Mad Men. Yes, fifty years because Mad Men sixties, right? Sixties. Yeah. So like a time we we've never seen, and we have very like at least for me, I have very little knowledge about it. Same for you, and it's crazy to see it it's cool to see it um it's dark it's new it's scary like back then like everything is like still being built yes and everything's like uh diy do it yourself diy do i what do diy diy see that's why we have ivan here <laughs> debauchery everywhere um debauchery. but inclusive you know, like in that time, they're like, oh, oh. we need a, a, a guy to hold a camera. You Mexican, hold the camera, right? Racism wasn't invented yet. Racism wasn't, a th- it was there, but they're like, we need to get this done. Like It wasn't a priority. It wasn't a priority. <laughs> Not like now, it's a priority now. And it's crazy because like <clears throat> we see how like the, the one of the main things in the movie is like, we haven't even talked about the plot really, but like the transition from... Uh, silent talkies, right? Mm-hmm. We're seeing this transition, but we're also seeing a transition from like inclusiveness to 
exclusiveness, mm -hmm. whether that's um, the inclusiveness of having Margot Robbie, Nelly, the Nelly character, being able to be in this movie, even though she's not a uh, quote unquote like a uh, good actress as far as verbally, but like we're able to put her in, her, in the movie because she she's a a star. She looks like a star mm -hmm. to um, the Lady Zhao character, right? Who's mm -hmm. like um, basically able to what does she do? She's like the screenwriter almost. She writes like the little titles for the oh yeah for the silence. <laughs> for the silent movies so we're, we're seeing this inclusive nature and then as time goes on as things become more sophisticated then we start Men. phasing out the black people phasing out the minorities phasing out all these things that used to be uh inclusive and now we're in an age in the 2020s where things are reverting the other way when things are becoming even more inclusive right so it inverted from inclusive to exclusive and now it's becoming inclusive again what so is there a trend here that we're seeing great depression is about to happen the great depression world war two or one we're going to one it'll be one. Oh god i'm scared great depression world war one oh yeah here we go um let's talk about the cast robbie and brad are in this movie as nelly and jack my one big gripe that i have is like we're, we're just casting the people in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. And they were in a similar kind of movie. It's kind <laughs> of like, can we not pick these two people for this movie? Because we've already kind of seen this. Obviously, they're not the same character, but talk, talk about like not being inventive with your casting. Like, I don't care. You don't care? No. Okay. That's just me then. Um, Robbie's character. Spitfire of a girl. <laughs> Red I hot ever, chili pepper. If I ever seen one. Graham Cracker. Not She's just like all energy, baby. Yeah. I think she has like bipolar disorder or something. Like in real life? Yeah. Or no. Or in the movie? The, in the movie. Yeah, she does. The Nelly character, she definitely does. And the movie just shows her rise and fall, and it's amazing to watch. She's a phoenix. Uh, and... Why does she want to be this famous actress? It seems like it comes from like being neglected as a child yeah. almost, right? Yeah. And this passion that she has also comes from like everyone in her hometown saying that she wouldn't make it. That's like one big thing she keeps on saying. But like I said, she's self-destructive too. She's a phoenix. And there's a point in the film where uh, she, it looks like she's going to get phased out. And at that point, she basically tries to kill her father by making him fight a snake. Mm -hmm. And then she almost kills herself by fighting the snake herself. That seems crazy. Like when the girl sucks the blood out of her neck. Oh my God. So much sound that they use. Yeah. I, I literally <laughs> thought she was dead. I was like, she's definitely dead now. Uh, I don't. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, hilarious scene. Yeah. Where she's just like running around. And then uh, Brad Pitt jack conrad's character i do find it <sighs> i'm conflicted here because like his character is basically like in the beginning he has so much energy but as the movie goes on he's kind of flat like there's not too much to him and he's not really a main priority of the movie it seems it's more about um Makes nelly sense. and manny yeah which is fine um but i just feel like you have brad pitt Use them as much as you can. But at the same time, that is the story of Jack Conrad, you know, like yeah. from this big, huge film star to basically silently killing himself. And uh, I guess I could see that. What do you think about Jack Conrad's character in this movie? I liked him. He was he was charming. He was slick. Yeah. I slick. mean, what a movie star. Like, yeah. if you're going to get a movie star, that's him. I <sighs> For me, every time he showed up, I was like, I was, I was there for that. Yeah. Anyone else, I was like, all right, this is cool. But where's yeah. Brad Pitt? Okay. I just really like that character. Yeah, I, I could see that. I. <sighs> Nelly's character to me was obviously like the most fun. Mm -hmm. I do think Jack's story is the most interesting, but I do think 
it was lacking something. I don't know what. I can't really tell you I what. I think it feels like that because, like, he fizzled out in the movie. Yeah. Like, so it's it, he's literally lacking something. Yeah. Because that's what happened to him. True. Yeah, that's a good point. That's a good point. Like, it's, oh, was it Tar at the end? When it's like, ah, uh, uh, that's it? Right. That's all that happened? But it's like, yeah. Like, yeah, she was a horrible person. Yeah. And this is like, uh, he had his time and he can't deal with not being at the top anymore. Yep. Like, just his own mental issues. Yep. One thing that I, I really enjoy <coughs> about this movie is like, it kind of has this weird analogy, I think, where Jack, he, he sees the potential in talkies, right? He's mm -hmm. like, this new technology of being able to talk in films is going to be great. Like yeah. it's just going to move the art forward. But the same, f the thing that he wants so much, this talkie technology is the thing that basically phases him out. And I think this is something Chazelle is highly in tune where he's like, this is kind of the analogy of streaming. I was going to, I thought you were going to say AI. Oh, no, I'm being more specific to the movie, but I could see that too. Mm. Where streaming is like every all of the movie industry wants is like all the streaming stuff, right? Mm. Like Disney, Paramount, NBC, Peacock, let's go. Come on. Streaming. I need a, streaming everything. But this is what's going to be like the death knell for for so many things. Mm -hmm. And the thing that you want so much is eventually going to be the thing that kills you. Right. I guess the same thing could be said about fame, but uh, and I, I want to talk more about that idea, like uh, streaming, and that uh, the idea of like the death of cinema, uh, at a later point because I have a hot take, and we could talk about the ending too. Mm. Um, do you? Who's like the most lovable? I shouldn't say lovable. Lovable slash noble character in this movie, Jack. I think so too. Like, he has like this idealism to him. Yeah, he's he's kind of like Don, like where he's a good person, but he just obviously has bad like things going for him. Like he had like fifty ex wives, and he oh, yeah. he knew how it would end with each one. Yep. But he didn't really care about changing it. Somewhat. With Don too. Yep. But yeah. And Manny, the <clears throat> <clears throat> probably the second lead in this movie. Mexican immigrant. He meets um Nelly at the party and Nelly asks him, Why do you want to be why do you why do you want to be in the movie industry? And while he's high on cocaine, he basically states just wanna be part of something bigger than what i've been in right i want to be i want to make an impact in this world right and that's kind of noble in itself right but he too in this pursuit gets corrupted yeah and he's kind of like the avatar for um shout out to james cameron he's the avatar for the audience because he's kind of uh going with the flow of things mm -hmm. more so than any other character uh, but he's like entranced by Nelly. Like, yeah. that's his girl. Whatever happens, that's his girl. Uh, what is it to start and forget? And yeah, I I kind of I kind of resonated with Manny not because he's Mexican, but I'll take that too. <laughs> um, cause he started something with a mission, and he forgot about that mission. You know, like there's this thing of like in life, you start something and you start it because of a specific thing and 20 years goes by and you're you just left without a clue of why you started. And then you remember somehow. But he did it, though. He just. Yeah. 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 Just Nelly took him out of it. Correct. But I, I like that idea of like, wait, why am I sniffing cocaine in this back alley with this girl that I like so much? Oh, yeah, it's because I want to make an impact. And uh, we'll talk about that at the end of this podcast with the end scene. What do you think about, like, 
the lack of more story to Sydney, the jazz musician, and Lady uh, Faye. It seems like they were going to be a big part, but then they kind of also didn't have too much screen time. Mm, I think um, I feel like I got everything I needed out of them, like the trumpet guy, the jazz musician, jazz yeah. musician, like his the big thing was when he had to put on blackface. Yeah. Like that was probably my favorite scene. Yeah. Just because when he was playing, you could see like the pain in his face. That was crazy. Yeah. Because again, the cost of fame, right? Like yeah. he wants to be big. He mm-hmm. wants to be famous. He wants the money. He wants the girls. He wants the cars. But what does it cost? It costs him his dignity. Yeah. Digni- dignity. Always dignity. I'll, I'll come back to that. But um, it cost him that. And then Lady Faye, I'm kind of confused about her because, like, she what? where does she end up? She was going to go to Europe, right? I think. I think her thing was that she's obviously talented, but sometimes like things phase out people change move out of your life kind of like no matter how talented she is which she's obvious she's like basically the asian nelly yeah because even nelly looks at her she's like oh my god yeah this beast and unfortunately she's asian (laughs) for her i mean like back then what snip that (laughs) <laughs> back then you couldn't be asian and be in the films without yeah. having a stereotypical character yep so now she's kicked out of the film industry and i guess it shows it's shitty to be anything but what people want yeah um one character that very side character but she delivers highly is the eleanor character the journalist oh yeah uh her, what does she do throughout the movie? She's like, has like a couple scenes where she talks about how good movies, what, what, what does she really do? Does the, it do? The reviewer? Yeah. The critic? Yeah. Be a cockroach? <laughs> she, but all that's to say is like, there's this one scene where she's talking to Jack where mm-hmm. I'm like, this is an amazing movie. Yeah. She ga- She basically gives a speech of like, Jack. You're washed up has been. You suck. You should basically kill yourself. But go to sleep knowing this. You're going to live forever. Yeah. As a ghost. When she's like talking about like the ghost in people's lives, I'm like, damn, that's creepy, but it's beautiful. Mm-hmm. And it just delivers on it. Mm-hmm. Um, Ivan, let's talk about the filming scenes in this movie. The scenes were... I think Chazelle's really transcend transcending and kind of like doing what he's good at. Yeah. The scene when Nelly is um basically filming her very first film and the director, who's a girl, might I add, is telling her like, do this, do that, now do this, and she's delivering on everything. Yeah. Oh, my God. It makes me, like, see... I like things like that because it shows, like, the real inner workings of being on a set and acting. Uh-huh. Because I'm sure, like, that happened with, like, Leo and Inaratu. Yeah. At some point where he's like, do this, do this, do that. Move your eyebrow, do that. Yeah. And Leo's just like, bam, 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 bam. Yeah. Because he's, like, that good. Yeah. But you don't see that. Like, they don't talk about that because that's, like... It's just something they don't talk about. Right. But to actually see that, maybe it's not as bad as that, but it's still, I'm sure it happens, and it's just super interesting to see. It is, but saying that, he is kind of romanticizing it in this, you know? Like, it's not that, it's not that, I I highly doubt that anyone can do it, like, on command like Nelly did. I think it's, like, romanticizing it, but, like, if it was a memory, because, like, I think... Like when they were filming that one scene with the suitcase and they have to yes. do that takes over and yep. over. I'm sure it was the worst thing ever, but when they finished it, they were like so happy and it right. was the best feeling ever, even though someone died in that hot box. <laughs> that scene was amazing. Just like the shift to like 
showing how difficult sound adding sound to films was. Yeah. And the fact that Nellie, this character who's never talked in a film, let alone been in too many films at all, right? Now she has to talk, say her her scene perfectly at the right tone, and all all these little things, and showing her being so freaking nervous. But once she's on, like she hits a flow state that yeah. you can't block. Yeah. And showing that was amazing. Yep. And then everyone being so mad at like every yeah at one, how difficult it was. The, the side director guy, he was insane. He was amazing. Like I didn't. That must have been so fun to put that like anger in yeah. that. And just like if you don't do this, <laughs> you are worthless. Yeah. Um uh, also the the war battle scene, that was so funny. Yeah. Just like how it was literally war. Literally like, war, people getting cut up, people getting stabbed, a dead. guy dying <laughs> just to film this war scene. And, like, the logistics of it showing, like, how they're basically homeless people that are being paid, like, dollar an hour mm-hmm. or less. So good. So good. Um, and then Jack, his kiss scene. When Same he's like, thing when he, like, get that flow state. Yeah. He's like, action. action. <laughs> yeah. Just, like, perfectly chiseled scowl. So good. So good. Um, the boat hole scene. Yeah, that was Toby Maguire. Toby Maguire, graham cracker of an actor. <laughs> so creepy. Yeah, Toby. Thank you, Toby, for doing this for the peeps. The makeup on him was Ugh. like, and they how they zoomed like they knew what they're doing, but it's so it it looks so great. Yeah, in the worst way. And it's good to like Toby seen as this boyish figure mm-hmm. and to see him manipulated like this is beautiful mm-hmm. great uh inversion um and then going into the butthole of los angeles there's a scene where basically the toby Maguire character who's essentially like a cocaine dealer a drug dealer big drug lord he takes the manny character and his friend to this place called the butthole of los angeles where just hedonistic things happen and it's the scariest thing you can imagine, you know? Like, this is way scarier than any horror movie I've seen in the past three months. Yeah. And it, I think it's scary because it kind of plays on the the conspiracy theories of what L.A., what the film industry is like. Like, people have, like, this uh, conspiracy theory of there's, like, a de- uh, demonic thing mm-hmm. underlying the film industry. And this kind of plays into it, and it's just so creepy. Ugh. That buff dude eating a rat. Oh, God, please. They were, they were pretty graphic with that. Like, yeah. A lot more than I've ever seen. Like, literally. Wow. How real was this? Oof. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Ivan, I think this movie's driving to the question of why do people want fame? Some lack. Lack of? Attention. Lack of love. <laughs> and it's 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 so... It's kind of so simple but so complicated, you know? Like, every... And, like, you, you don't want to be... You don't want to be... Um, I guess I don't want to look at all my... My movie stars that I love and be like feel pity because they're probably Mm. really sad inside i think modern ones aren't as sad yeah maybe brad pitt he might be in like the last of that like i want to be a star yeah but he seems like he has a good head i don't know about that but besides his allegations yeah i mean it's like hard to say that about anyone now without saying besides their allegations (laughs) let's just assume everyone has allegations and we'll be like on equal ground i mean and then we move forward there's allegations on me oh don't i know it just there i'm a nobody so no one really knows except for you um yeah it's uh it's interesting because 
Uh, no, I'll talk about it later. Um, let's talk about the end scene. The end is kind of mind blowing, and it it led me down a path which I'll go into after this. But the end scene is basically Manny twenty years later, after some shit happens. Um, just leave it at that. He goes to watch a movie called Singing in the Rain, and while watching it, he basically has this catharsis epiphany where he realizes like, well, he sees his own life and Nellie's life in this movie. Right. And he also sees like, he basically sees why he, he, he gets reminded of why he even went into the movie business. Um, and the montage of all the films at the end of this movie from the beginning of the film industry to Avatar, is yeah. it, there's a man- montage of of that in this Crazy. film. When you saw that, what were you what were you thinking? I'm like, <laughs> Avatar. Uh, it reminded me of the end of Black Clans- Black Klansman. Okay, yeah, with that montage at the end. Sure, but it just like this one felt. I'm not comparing them, but yeah. this felt like like there's just a lot of love in what he was doing like it didn't feel like we get it you like movies if i like i love movies and like this is why sort of thing yeah um let me see if i have this here before i get to it okay might as well do it. do you think he's kind of saying okay you're saying this is i love movies this is why that's what you just said right yeah is he also saying, "This is I love movies, and this is dying." All of it, <laughs> all of this, all of this, yeah. all that I just showed you, plus all of these films that we've all loved, that we've all seen. It's film history. Uh-huh. It's dead. Why? Streaming. And we're we're transitioning now to a new time from. It was silent to talkies and things died. Mm-hmm. Now the theater, the theater is going to die soon and we're transitioning to something else. I think if I, I didn't get that, but if he thinks that he's dead wrong, you think so? He's dead wrong, Adrian. Cause I think is he dead wrong or he's wrong. Cause he's, like he's dead wrong. Okay, okay go Dead wrong. Oh. <laughs> um, I think it's just gonna change. Like with AI art, you're gonna have to adapt. But I don't. I really don't think it's gonna go away. I think a lot more movies and TV are gonna be streaming, but there are always gonna be people who are gonna want it at the theater. And I think just it's more like the box office. Like that doesn't actually matter anymore. It doesn't. I don't think so. Like streaming, the subscribers, that's what matters. If they're just constantly making money subscribing, like they could just make movies, like have a budget. Here's 10 billion for 2023. The rest goes to salary, this, 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 that. Rebuttals. Disney just lost hundreds of millions of dollars because of streaming and other stuff. Okay. Um,. And this movie was a box office bomb. Yeah. Um, the box office is not is doing okay, but that's because of huge, particular huge movies, right? Yeah. Overall, movies like this, movies that aren't superhero epics, aren't making that much money. Mm-hmm. And the streaming um, goals so far. <coughs> have shown to be not that uh, monetarily successful. So what's the, what's the answer? If, if you say that movie theaters aren't dying, but movies like this Babylon are dying, dying and streaming isn't successful. What's next? I think it just needs to find an equilibrium. I, I feel like Disney's like, Ooh, we're gonna make billions and billions on Netflix streaming. too. 
HBO too. They're all hitting on hard times. Just quality over quantity. But what about this movie? Like this is quality. Some might pe- some people say it's shit to be honest. <laughs> but I think it's just in a bad period of movie releases. Like maybe in 20 years this would have been amazing. 20 years ago it would have been amazing. But I think where we're at now it's like a weird like choose a side sort of thing or like find the find the like, equilibrium of what it's actually going to be. I I I don't see movie theaters dying, and. But what about um, movies, other than. Marvel. Superhero movies. I don't think. No way. This phase can't last forever. Like I know, like how long did Cowboys last? How long did. Mafia last. Mm-hmm. Like it's all a phase. There's no way. Those are genres. Superheroes genre. True. Oh, okay. Yeah, I see that. I don't know. I I am s- I am scared because this movie did so poorly in the box office, <coughs> and the fact that this movie is really good, or at least it's trying to say something. Yeah. And I think the fact that it's trying to say something and it did bad is a bad sign. That's what I'm scared about. But. There's movies that are coming out that are not Marvel and they're making good money. It's just not billions. Yeah, that's true. I just it's just bad luck. I think that's just it. Mm. Mm, mm, mm. Um okay, I'll take that. Ivan, this movie introduced me to Singing in the Rain. It's a movie that I was like I'm never going to see that movie. But after seeing this movie, I'm like I, I, it's interesting, but still not pushed over. Then I read a review, and they said this movie's like Singing in the Rain, but the demon version, basically. Hmm. So I'm like, I gotta see Singing in the Rain. I watched it, and I was kind of blown away by it because it's. I thought it was like a romantic musical comedy type of movie, mm-hmm. but it is that. But it's also about the transition from silent to talkies, mm. in like as a plot right. in there. And uh, that kind of was revealing, but it's interesting because this movie is a modern version of Singing right. in the Rain, and it's kind of a modern musical. Yeah, yeah. Because we can't, it's hard to do musicals now without being super corny. And this movie's like, it's a musical in a, in a very sly way, you know? Yeah, like the suitcase thing, there's definitely like beats to it. Uh-huh. Like, no, no, bad. Uh, cut, go. Uh, cut, no. Right. And you you just can't be overtly musical. You just have to be so you have to you have to sneak it in in different ways. Yeah. And I think that's something very uh modern in movies like you have to do things not overtly. It's like for them blend, to be good. blending it. Yes. Instead of just being a straight it's a it's a comedy like yeah. no it's a comedy horror action thriller yes. like that's what you got to do yeah and that's just like everything coming together and something that this movie <coughs> both movies did is they showed how like how silent to talky the silent way of acting doesn't transition to the talky way of acting where jack in this movie is like i love you i love you i love you and people thought it was corny Mm-hmm. And that same scene was in uh, Singing in the Rain, where the silent guy, he says in the movie, like, I love you. I love you. I love you. And people were laughing at him, too. Mm. I was like, damn, this movie's just like basically the same, but just like it shows the real raw uh, Hollywood. Yeah. Like the moid- the moida. And that's another modern thing. Like, you couldn't do that in Singing in the Rain mm. in the 50s because they didn't show killing Moya. Sex and drugs, you know? Yeah. But now you can show that. Um, another thing is just like the craziness that the same people that made Singing in the Rain were doing the things that Babylon was showing. Yeah. You know? Just like that existed and it was real. Hmm. Um, Ivan, let's rate this movie. Out of five... <laughs> 
Takis. Out of five Takis. How many Takis is this? I give it 4.9 Takis. Wow. 4.9, right? Yep. Out of five. Uh, I wanted to change it up. Okay. Just for to be funny. It's funny. Yeah. Really funny. Thanks. Out of five Takis, I give this a 4.5 Takis. One thing that's working against this film is it's like the fifth three-hour movie I've seen in the past two months. Mm. Jesus Christ with these three-hour movies, right? But, like, this movie actually has a purpose to use yeah. it. Like a stylistic purpose. Yeah. I think, I mean, it, it flew it flew by for me. Yeah. So did Avatar. So I... Uh, no, no, yeah, yeah. Uh, I was just thinking. I I don't mind it as long as you're smart with it. Like if you're if you're a director and you're doing three hours, just like think first. Like does this does this need three hours? Like take a long hard look. Does it need it? <laughs> I'm talking to you, Damien. Oh, no, you're not. Oh. You're actually talking to. What was the last other than this one? Irishman. No. Three and a half hours. Get a life. Yeah, that could have used some trimming. I don't know, but Bardo. Uh, I forget. I haven't finished the last thirty minutes because <laughs> it was so. It's a hard movie to watch. Hell yeah, we'll talk about it. Two weeks from now, I think. Jesus Christ. Uh. Okay, that's good. Evan. Next week we're gonna do Glass Onion, a Knives Out mystery. Knives in or Knives Out? Knives Out. Um, you already watched it, right? Okay. Good. Oh, and I have some opines on opinions. That. I'll opine on that movie for opinions. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's time for a section we'd like to call Things and Such. The trailer for Bayo is Afraid came out. Did you see Did you see it? It's Bo. Bo is Afraid. Did you watch yes. it? Yes. I didn't know what it was about, but I guess that's a good trailer. Um. Opinions? I, I think it's like a Truman Show thing, isn't it? Really? If like people are watching it? Something like that. I don't know. I think it's more like... Uh, Misery? What? Misery? No, I think it's more like Bardo. Just like surreal. <laughs> Which I'm not a fan of surreal. But if, if you do it like just... Surreal is good if it's like an hour and 30 minutes. But when it's three hours, <laughs> you're pushing my uh, my buttons. Yeah. Uh, like, I like surrealness in pieces. I don't mm. like complete surrealness. Right. I mean, I'll watch it. I hope it's not more than two hours. Uh, but I don't know if it's surreal or not. It's right. it's just like you... It, to me, it reminded me of, like, um, Alice in Wonderland, the trailer. Alice in Wonderland, it reminded me of Dorothy, uh, Wizard of Oz, because you got Truman Show out of it. Yes. I don't know. My my hopes aren't as high as they were before. I thought it would be a little scarier from uh, just because well, that's what he does. Yeah. But maybe I just have to change my my thoughts on that. Yeah, it's more comedy, they said. Uh, I mean, he's good. I'll watch it. Oh, he's good. Um, Francis Ford Coppola's Megapolis. Megapolis. He's self-financing this movie, and it's uh, going over budget, and they lost, like, a bunch of people, like, staff, like, creative designer or whatever. Um, hopefully, he finishes this movie. It has, like, the greatest cast of all time, Adam Driver and other people. Say less. Exactly. Come on. And I just, it's interesting, because this guy's, like, 85, and he's making a huge sci-fi epic it's sci-fi ish like sci-fi tinge they say oh, like like interstellar i don't know maybe so and it's <laughs> the name megaopolis it's like jesus christ what is that's gonna be four hours <laughs> at least <laughs> welcome to my eight hour film i'll Eat watch this it. up um it's like a two hour nap intermission <laughs> <laughs> they're really testing our patience ivan um so i don't know we'll see 
things and such. I I finished Dune Messiah. Good. Shout out to Frank Herbert Frank for Coppola for just inverting Dune and being like, oh, this Paul guy, evil. He's actually whack. I like how he's just like punk rock like that. <laughs> Relax. And back when like Star Wars was like the thing, he's like, nah, this is the thing. I hope uh, uh, Denny is able to finish up until that movie at least. That's like two more movies, isn't it? He could do, yeah, it's two more movies. It's, he needs to finish part two, dude, yeah. and then finish Messiah in one. I don't know. Timothy's going to be like 40 by then. I'll take that. No, because Dune 2 is over. Uh, it's over. They already finished filming. Okay, 30. Jeez. All right. Uh, I have an aside for a section called What's on the Telly? You've been watching Seinfeld. You're back at it, aren't you? Rewatch. Like a fiend. It's a great show. There should be a modern Seinfeld. Like with modern sensibilities, update it. What's like the modern Seinfeld? Uh, isn't that uh, um, the guy that made Seinfeld's other show? Curb. Yeah. I don't know. People love Curb. There's like Curb fanatics. But it's so like, it's so nerdy. Like, can they make a cool? Sh- I don't want to watch an eighty-year-old with okay. a show. Yeah, but it's it's like real life stuff. It's true. But he's also rich. He's also filthy rich. Okay, so you want like a Mexican Seinfeld guy? Sure. Okay. Just something a little modern. Point taken. I finished watching White Lotus. Really good. So good. Really good. Uh, I um didn't expect that to happen. The the uh, death. Yeah. I didn't think it was that kind of show. But you watched the first season. No, but where it was like such an evil sort of death. Oh, like yeah. People being this evil. Yeah. I I thought it would be a little more. I didn't think it would be like that. When did you when did you feel like she might die? There was a point where. I mean, it was pretty heavily hinted, but when he was talking to her and then like there's a shift in his face and he was like. Wouldn't it be better to like die for beauty or something like that? Uh huh. But he had like a little devilish look to him. Yeah. I was like, there's something's gonna happen. Yeah. Like there's something else. For me, it was um, when I realized like that the guy that Portia was hooking up with uh-huh. and the uncle once they're related, <laughs> and I was like. No, something's weird here. Uh, like, I didn't know, but something weird is going on. Like, why are they always hanging out? Why is he always there with them? Like, And then when they're going on the bum, I'm like, oh, she's dead. Someone's dead. I'm glad Portia didn't die. Yeah, that would be like sad. she, Her whole thing was, like, so much anxiety. Yeah. Like, come on, don't kill her. She doesn't <laughs> deserve this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Did and you I, know he was getting played, Albie? Yeah. You knew the whole time? Yeah. Like, yeah. Because, like, every time she yeah. she was, every time she kept asking for money and then, like, it was obvious. Even at the end with the, the guy coming in saying, like, I need my money sort of thing. You thought yeah. you knew it then? Uh, I didn't think he was with her. I think, I didn't know he was part of the con. Yes. But I still thought she's not going to go with him. Like there was a hint, a very slight hint of me that was like, Oh, maybe he'll get, he'll get lucky. <laughs> but mostly I was like, nah, he's, he's done. I thought she was. Cause like she mentioned earlier, she always wanted to go to LA. Uh huh. So, and she was pretty convincing when, yeah. When she needed to be. Yeah. <laughs> she got me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that cut the, I think the thing that was like, so like, disgusting was like the couples yeah that was just like oh i can't take this anymore that was like mind-blowing to me like yeah. all their conversations and then when what's his face the asian guy yeah uh, talk to the white, white girl, girl. <laughs> yeah we only know races here i know that's us 
uh and they had that conversation i was like this is pretty crazy like yeah. what she's doing like she was like probably the smartest person in the whole show mm-hmm. probably unhealthy yep but Smart. it's insane yeah. like what she was how she thought and how she like rationalized things yes i was like i was looking at her face like what are you yeah <laughs> what beast are you kind of sick smart beast are you yeah yep did you know he was planning that the whole time uh but that's the thing like and that's what makes the good the show so good is like they never say yeah what the real intentions behind everyone is right and i highly doubt that any answer is correct mine is okay i'm pretty he planned that from the start like the reason he invited them was to seduce his wife and that was it mm. and he only went because he wanted to show off that he was rich mm-hmm. but that dude is like a master seducer but then like yeah master sedu- yeah that's right but also i think it was subconsciously that our asian boy did it because he wanted to show he was rich yeah, yeah. Like, that was subconscious. He was more like, it would be okay, but subconscious, like, rich. pushing him. I'm rich. Let's go. Yeah. That's what's the show. The show's good for that. Mm. Great show. Yeah. Season three in Japan, most likely. Yeah. The music of that show. Yeah. Oh, oh, oh. So good. Uh,. And there's a lot more there's a lot more shows that I want to watch this year. Like um I watch I listen to this podcast called uh, The Last The Watch by The Ringer and they had like top 10 shows and one of the the guy that created um Mr. Robot, he was a guest host and he's he's a great uh speaker. Not a sp- great speaker, but he's a great host. Mm-hmm. And he gave his top 10 shows. One of them is the White Lotus, but like the way they talk about all the shows, like damn, I have to watch all these shows. What were some? Andor was number one for a lot of them. <laughs> Whatever. His number one <laughs> was uh, you're gonna love this. Um, the guy that made Mr. Robot, his number one show of 2022 was the rehearsal. Oh, yeah, <laughs> deserved. Yeah, deserved. And uh, his. His other shows were um, The White Lotus, Andor was one of his. It was like number six. Um, Dahmer oh, wow. was one of his. Uh, yeah. Industry was one of the other ones. You should really watch Andor. Like the fact that all these people are saying <laughs> the best show. Like I can't believe you don't want to watch it. it. And I'm telling you, it's literally amazing. I know I'll love it, but I don't want to watch <laughs> it. <laughs> such a jerk <laughs> like what you, what was the other show that you watched last week that you you told me about i'm like you've seen that but you like even the fact that you watched the white lotus before you watch andor is kind of crazy to because i don't really care about star wars i know but it's like i know it's not that i know it's not that boy i know <laughs> it's just such a good show okay there's other shows i want to wa- i want to watch reservation dogs i want to watch oh. severance yes um there's so many things so many things yeah <laughs> what are you gonna watch next la la land yeah i'm gonna watch a lot of uh I'm, I'm on this like i have this urge to watch spikely movies spikely joints spikely mean? joints i have an for a section called really be busting <laughs> Anything for you? <laughs> I haven't listened to like rap in months. Anything? No. No. I'm on a jazz kick. I'm trying to learn more about jazz. Just interesting. I think uh, this movie kind of pushed me Babylon. And also, Chazelle, he's a big jazz hit. So I'm like, ah, oh, shit. I'm going to get back into jazz. But one thing that I, I wanted to mention last podcast, and it was happened like two weeks ago, that I got this urge to revisit Kendrick's uh, Mr. Morale. And I saw Mr. R- Morale uh, concert on Amazon. It was so good. Yeah. And it explained the album a little bit more to me. Like, 
it was more nuanced of like what the story he was telling and the album was really good and you have it has you have to kind of be like on that path to understand the album because mm-hmm. like he's talking about choosing himself and all that, you know and i kind of see it you know and i see the whole picture and uh it goes back to like him being like i don't want fame i want to be happy mm-hmm. and i'm choosing me over all that shit yeah and he's like sorry guys peace i'm out deuce just a uh an album that's probably not like as like bombastic not as like listenable as his other albums um but, but it's part of the point part of the point and yeah part par- it's it's like a journal Mm-hmm. And it's open. Great album. Having any party words for the beautiful people? No. All right, people. We'll be back next week with Glass Onion. And Ivan has some opinions. Mm-hmm. All right. Peace out. Bye.